I should uh, perhaps explain uh, that I'm on the as chair, of, chair of the select committee, I'm on the liaison committee, which is all these select chairs. And um, I've been appointed rapporteur for a lot of work to look at the powers of select committees. And um, uh, it's like um, um, it's like the hunting of a snark. Um, and you, you've got this extremely clever and intelligent and helpful people in the clubs. Perhaps it's the hunting of the club. But also have um, differing and interesting and fascinating perspectives uh, on this topic. Um, and we'll be hearing from Anna Kenna uh, later on. Um, but I think we need to start from some very, very first principles. One learns new words. This, um, uh, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but you learn new words in, in the process of uh, understanding this. First of all, um, the powers of uh, select committees very much depends upon parliamentary privilege, which rests on the line of the um, 17th, uh, 16th, 18th, 19th, 19th, 19th of rights. And there is no doubt that that article is law. And moreover, there's no doubt the courts have a record of according that law a status of a constitutional act of Parliament. And this is a distinction that uh, uh, the courts themselves have made. The certain acts of Parliament are, are, are superior to other acts of Parliament. Acts of Parliament like um, um, the, uh, uh, the, the Magna Carta, or which is not Magna Carta, the Magna Carta aspect. Of Union, uh, the Devolution Acts, the European Communities Act, uh, these are deemed to be acts of special significance. And Article 9 remains the law. Article 9 establishes, um, well, sets out the principle that certain matters are what we call an exclusive cognizance of Parliament. Um, and the question is, um, what are the limits of that exclusive cognizance? And I, here, the Chater case, the Chater case is uh, quite uh, controversial, but historically it's been Parliament to determine what is in its own exclusive competence. Um, and the, the, the court's more aggressive approach to this reflects uh, perhaps a division amongst um, the most senior judges. There are some who are more traditional and in respect to the uh, exclusive competence of parliamentary privilege and indeed the sovereignty of Parliament. Other judges who have been dealt the free, the, 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 um, uh, the uh, uh, common law radicals um, actually believe that the court's powers um, uh, predate the concept of parliamentary sovereignty and therefore uh, the common law that the um, uh, sovereignty of parliament is an emanation of the common law and therefore they can define and limit it. I think there's a fundamental problem uh, in defining uh, or trying to limit parliamentary sovereignty in that way, which is that um, uh, any act of parliament trumps the common law. Uh, whatever the common law is, if parliament passes an act of parliament, it trumps the common law. So uh, I think we are absolutely stuck with, with this uh, Dicean notion of parliamentary sovereignty. Parliament can make or unmake any law, um, and uh, the courts are obliged to enforce it. And the, the, if we were to, I think if Parliament was to push that notion too far, uh, and particularly with regard to Article 9, uh, we would find ourselves in the political courts. Um, uh, so I don't think there's any. Um, easy way through this, however, however um, straight, stridently you take a very traditional view of parliamentary sovereignty and Article 9. Though in a very British way, I expect we will find our way through it. By a combination of all three of the options set out in this model's paper, um, on some things we will do nothing. On some things we should perhaps um, 
make our standing orders much clearer and more specific. Um, and we need to be, as a part, very judicious and careful in the way we exercise powers under standing orders. Um, I mean, gone are the days when uh, Parliament could pass a resolution and the Sergeant of Arms would appoint a posse of horsemen ride out into the night and clap somebody in irons. I don't suppose uh, that could happen again. Um, but on the other hand, I think the courts themselves do not want to become enmeshed in every detail of how Parliament exercises its exclusive cognizance and how certain countries exercise their powers. There wants to be sort of a practical understanding. This, I love this new phrase that I have before, okay? um, an organizational truce. And, and we need to, um, I, I think Parliament has been careless of these powers. Parliament has, been, uh, has made the assumption that these powers um, are inviolable. And, and then there's been a long period, perhaps, when people have quietly said them to themselves, oh, well, we don't want to say anything about this because we're all the world. And that the debate is now well and truly in the open, uh, that we're going to have to address this. And um, uh, I suspect that an element of legislation will be necessary. Uh, but it will not be, I don't think, necessary to, to put into the statutes all our powers. In fact, I think that's a mistake. I don't think the courts would actually want us to do that. Um, I, I think it might be necessary to make explicitly clear that the European Communities Act and the Human Rights Act um, um, apply notwithstanding certain aspects of Parliament. And in fact, it's regularly the proposed in recent years of the European Communities Act and the Human Rights Act. Um, the, the statute, that we should be able to define parliamentary sovereignty in statute, um, notwithstanding the European Communities Act, notwithstanding the Human Rights Act. So that, um, uh, again, there's been an argument in Parliament about international law, and these, of course, relate to international law. Jack Straw, for a while, in the last Parliament, tried to maintain that uh, uh, international law was superior to parliamentary sovereignty. But actually, again, if we pass an act of Parliament in the United Kingdom, it trumps any international law if we choose it to do so. There's no question that uh, Parliament is sovereign within its own domain of, of domestic law. And indeed, um, uh, an American constitutionalist would say the same, um, uh, or would have said the same until um, perhaps uh, United States signed up to the International Criminal Court. Uh, and even then, I think um, you find the Karlsruhe Court, for example, in Germany, would um, assert that the German basic law was superior to any other law. So, this idea of, cons of, of constitutional sovereignty of Parliament in our own constitution is not peculiar to our other constitution. Now, the reason I say all this is uh, the word, the other word that I've discovered is to dissuade now it's called to do suetude. And it's a very useful word. Um, have I said it right? Um, uh, but um, uh, the reason I say all this is because it is clear that, um, first of all, that certain countries have powers. They you have know, clear powers. And I noticed the, um, my learned counsel's um, uh, qualification in this comment that um, they may not have clear powers, but they have powers. And they have powers. Uh, that they derive from uh, standing orders and article 9. And uh, the question is how do we redefine those powers by standing orders, how do we protect those powers, uh, possibly by legislation, um, and how we exercise those powers uh, within a framework of consent, such that even the free law radicals, the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the um, common law radicals in, uh, in the Supreme Court will feel um, that it's not worth the candle to mess with Parliament's powers. Um, I'm sure not even uh, the most radical uh, judicial supremacists uh, would want Parliament shorn of its powers. Um, there is something of a struggle between some in the judiciary who believe in judicial supremacy rather than parliamentary supremacy. But in the end, I have no doubt that Parliament um, will maintain the supremacy 
simply because there is a fact which uh, cannot be undone. Parliament cannot undo its own sovereignty. It cannot legislate away. It cannot pass a law to say the Parliament is no longer sovereign simply because it could, the following year, pass a law to reverse that law. And um, I think that puts the Trump card in Parliament's hands. Uh, though in the modern uh, framework, 